It's the blue. Oh, here we go. Redirecting to the page. And I'm looking at the YouTube page. Yeah, you're live. Okay. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Welcome to Radical Breaks and Remakes. I'm Dan Aviv. I will be your host. And I don't know what else to really say beyond that at this point. Um, I uh, wrote a book a number of years ago, which I'll get into, which kind of looked at moments of radical break and remake. And so this uh, episode tonight will be dealing exclusively with kind of like the idea or the thesis of the book. And then I'll, I'll, uh, in coming weeks, next week, the week after, etc., I'm going to look at some very specific uh, phenomena that we're noticing that might sort of intimate where things are going after COVID-19, hopefully where things are going after COVID-19. So I'm going to share a screen with you. It'll take me a moment to make the transition, and then I will sort of lay things out for you. If you have any questions, you can uh, hit me up in the chat. I want to see if I can have a look at that, where we're going. Here we go. So, like I said, I wrote this book a number of years ago, actually a little bit around 2008, 2009, and my uh, publisher allowed me to get away with this book title called End of the Jews, Radical Breaks, Remakes, and What Comes Next. And uh, I think Either people thought it was a how-to or they were just scared off by the title. Um, either way, I did beat the average sales for nonfiction. So that was some small consolation. But the thing is, I didn't realize that when I wrote the book, you know, now something like 12, 11, 12 years ago, that it would come back with a vengeance. Um, this image that you see to your left of your screen um, is kind of a study in contrasts because what you have here is a Haredi, an ultra-Orthodox man, on his cell phone, and behind him is a wall with Pashkevilim. Um, Pashkevilim are, are broadsides or posters that are posted in public spaces in Haredi enclaves. They're sometimes distributed anonymously. They're, many of them are posted with rabbinic endorsements uh, or the name of some kind of activist group at the bottom. And uh, they're very interesting to me for a variety of reasons. Um, first of all, the name itself, Pashkevil. Um, if you try to look and dig into the origin of that word, there is a, a columnist at the forward named Philologos who said that the word Pashkevil, which is in Yiddish, uh, was borrowed from the Polish, which was then borrowed from the French Pasquil, uh, which goes back to the French Pasquin or Pasquin, which comes from the Italian Pasquinata, where the word Pasquinata in English comes from which I had to look up in the dictionary means a satire or lampoon. Now, the thing is, where does even this Italian word come from? Well, turns out that in 1501, when they were doing renovations on the Orsini Palace in Rome, uh, they found this statue in the ruins. And uh, they put it up on the street in the square. Um, we don't know why they call it a Pasquino. That was the name that the locals gave to it. Some people think it's because Signor Pasquino had a barber shop. Uh, or a tavern nearby, or he was a tailor, or that he was a high school teacher that the, that the kids wanted to make fun of. Uh, either way, it's located on a square that is very commonly used by the Pope as he parades from the Vatican to the center of Rome. So people would kind of come by and leave signs hanging around Pasquino's neck, uh, making fun of the Pope, criticizing the Pope. Uh, it was done anonymously and you know, all kinds of barbs and jokes. And eventually, you know, as you can see in this picture, people are still doing it today. They're just not doing it on the statue because the statue is like, you know, 700 or sorry, 500 years old. But people are still very salty about the affairs of the day. So what you have in this Pashkavil is kind of this opportunity to sort of make a public statement. But at the same time, you see this gentleman uh, with his back to the wall on his flip phone. So what 
is going on in this book? What, what do I mean by radical breaks and remakes? Well, this ties into the question or the, or the way that we as Jews think about history. Um, we have a very unique way of thinking about it. You know, if you think about how the discipline was taught in schools, you know, Jewish history is not like Canadian history. Um, and in a sense, it's kind of ties into this question of what is the relationship between history and memory? Well, history, as you recall from those, you know, hefty textbooks that were handed to you at the first day of school um, in middle school is, you know, presents itself as remembering everything. It's clear and objective. It's linear. You know, the events are laid out in a nice sequence. And of course, it's written down. Whereas memory, as we know from the fact that I couldn't subtract, you know, 1501 from 2020, memory is forgetful. It's subjective. Uh, it's shaded. Um, it's unreliable. It's repetitious. You know, you tell the same story five times. Um, and most of all, memory is usually verbally transmitted. I would imagine that, that you know, in the last 10 years or so, our memories, we tend to capture more with our cell phones, uh, with, with pictures. But up until, you know, the advent of the smartphone or the phone with the proper camera, we were doing it um, verbally. So you have this kind of tension between these two uh, ideas. And if you had to represent, you know, in a way, what Jewish history or Jewish memory looks like, this uh, comes to us, this image comes to us from Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz. Uh, you may know him as the translator of the Babylonian Talmud into modern Hebrew. And he sort of, he wrote a piece in some, in, in an Israeli army journal that no one reads except for keeners and such. Um, and he wrote this piece about what Jewish history is like um, and how you can imagine it. And he sort of presented this idea that Jewish history is kind of like this double helix. That, you know, it has a beginning and an end. So the beginning, of course, is the creation. Again, in, in Jewish memory, that's where it begins. And then it ends with the arrival of the Messiah. There are two streams uh, running in parallel to each other with connection, connecting points. We're in the present, but we're always kind of oriented or connected to the past. So as I believe uh, Dan Levinson said on a panel that I participated in, one could almost see that the Seder of 2020 has very strong resonance and connections to that first night you know, back in Egypt when the children of Israel were commanded to take those lambs into their homes, you know, dab its blood on the doorpost and then go into their homes and eat the roast lamb and don't come out because what's outside is very dangerous. So in a sense, the Seder this year is going to be a very different Seder than we had last year, and it's going to resonate going back. And I can imagine the Seder 2021, when we get to go out again, God willing, and into the streets, will be definitely a celebration of freedom. So we're always in the present, but we're always kind of rooted in the past. And the fact is, you know, we don't even really have a word for history in, in, in Jewish tradition. I mean, we've, we've loaned, it's a loan word from the Greek. Uh, and the word historia or historia in Greek actually co consists of two words. Its etymology is, comes from the word um, historio, which means I inquire, or and histor, which means one who knows. So you, so you sort of are asking somebody who knows about the past. What we do have, though, that's words that are native to Hebrew, is the word zikaron, which means memory, and divrei hayamim, which is sort of like a, a cataloging or like the words of the day, or the words of the days, which we translate in English as chronicle. But that's it. That's how we sort of appreciate history. So when uh, Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi, who was the professor of Jewish history at Columbia University in his book Zachor, uh, asked the question, you know, why... Why, if the memory is so problematic, if memory is, you know, a mess, it's deceptive, it's, it's treacherous, why does the Torah command us to do it? Because it, the Torah does in numerous places. It requires, commands us to remember the Shabbat, and it remembers, it commands us to remember what Amalek did to the Jewish people as they left Egypt. And so he understands that as a historian, uh, memory is not the same as history, but in a sense, <clears throat> excuse me, in a sense, um, it's really history with a layer of meaning. So you're going to take that objective, linear, you know, narrative, and you're going to layer over it a set of questions of what, where, who, and when, you're going to add why. And that really what makes Jewish history different. Um, and as I'm sure you know, as it involves Jews with questions about why, there's going to be a lot of disagreements. Um, 
and and very often when they ask the question, what are you trying to remember? Very often it's remembering tragedies. This poster, I don't know if you could see it very clearly um, on your screens, um, comes to us from the Central Committee of Liberated Jews. They were an organization which represented Jews, displaced Jews uh, after the war uh, in the American zone between 1945 and 1950. They were recognized by the US Army as like the legal and democratic representation of liberated Jews in Germany, and they produced uh, posters. And if I don't know if you can tell from the details here, but essentially what you have in the center uh, is a clock face. Um, it says on top, remember what Amalek did to you. This is, again, an allusion to Deuteronomy 25. Um, and uh, it has four historical events in clockwise fashion. On the upper left are the pyramids, and you have, it says they're Egyptian bondage, and there's a picture of a Haggadah. Then to the right of it, you have the destruction of the temple and Megillat Echa, or Lamentations. Then underneath that, you have the uh, Spanish expulsion, Gerush Sfarad, um, and the book, uh, Emeka Bacha, or Valley of Tears, which describes that uh, terrible experience. And then the, the, the penultimate one is what they call Gzerot Tat Vetach, which refers to the Chomnitsky massacres in the 17th century, um, 1648 to 1658. There's a, a book there as well, Yevin Mitzula, The Abyss of Despair. But then, of course, you see a skeleton standing, and he's pointing to the six million where it says once and for all. So we kind of have this, this tendency, <clears throat> excuse me, when we, when we remember the past to remember the bad events, the tragedies, the traumas. So when I sat down to write this book, End of the Jews, this really uplifting uh, title, um, I was sort of looking at what was going on as part of the 2008 financial crisis, which arguably so many economists have said we really haven't truly recovered from yet. I was working as a, in a synagogue as an educational director and you know you open up the, the internet, you're reading the news and you see Lehman Brothers collapses and then you start to see you know, this school shutters, this synagogue closes. It really felt at that moment, and then Bernie Madoff made all this money disappear. It really felt as if the third temple was collapsing before my eyes. And then I started to think, well, you know, clearly, you know, have, ha having remembered all the other temple destructions and such, you know, what, is there something we can learn from that? Is there something we can learn from that dynamic of crisis, break, and remake? Um, in many instances, the uh, radical break was forced upon us. We didn't choose it. It kind of just happened to us for various reasons. And then it precipitates a radical break from the status quo. And then it forces a remake after the fact. Now, I say remake and not a reboot because a reboot... I mean, we know this from our laptops or our computers. When they freeze, we reboot it. And what does it do? It sort of takes us back to the way it was before the crash, before the freeze. Um, I'm not talking about that. When I was talk when I'm talking about it, and again, looking back in history, are, are remakes. That is, you make significant changes, but at the same time, you remain loyal to a previous established continuity. So you have all the things that happened before. You don't erase it completely. You have connections to it, but you make changes. And so what I basically did in the rest of the book, or not the rest of the book, but in a significant portion of it, I sort of went through history and demonstrated how, in fact, this was the case. And so I talked about the sacrificial period, because if you think about, you know, the way that Jews were Jews back in the old days, and I'm not talking about the old country, you know, shtetls of Poland. I'm talking about Abraham and the, and the patriarchs, Sarah and the matriarchs. And not just them, by the way, it goes really far along. Um, the way that Jews related or the way that Jews Jewed, you know, if you consider Jew as a verb, um, what, how did they Jew? Well, they, they offered sacrifices. That was how um, they manifested their connection to God. And that, I guess, was the most public form of Judaism at the time, I guess. Um, and if you look at the Torah, 10 of the 613 commandments um, relate to the temple and, and sacrifices and if you start to add all the, the regulations around the priests who facilitate the sacrifices in the temple compound, it's another 50. So you get to something like 25% of the commandments 
deal with sacrifices. So it was a pretty important part of people's lives. And, in, and, and the fact is archaeology supports this as well. Here's some examples of, of uh, altars, of bamot, uh, that we found in the land of Israel. The one on the left uh, is called the Altar of Manoach. Supposedly, this was the altar of the father of Samson. It's near Kibbutz Tzorah. And the one on the right is very famous. It often appears in the Israel Museum catalogs. This is what's called the horned altar. They found this in a private residence. But the thing is that, you know, sacrifices at the time and, it, you know, again, continuing much later on, it was not just exclusively a Jewish thing, right? Um, pretty much every culture sacrifices or has some kind of animal sacrifice. The Egyptians, the Aztecs, the Yoruba, um, it's still practiced today by followers of Santeria. There are some villages in Greece where Christians will bring what's called the Korbania, where they sacrifice an animal as well. Um, so what does a korban do? What does a sacrifice do? It's supposed to appease God in some way. It's supposed to change the course of nature. And in some cases, it just has a very, you know, it's social function. Israelites, the Jews, slaughtered animals. They brought agricultural products to these altars. Um, sometimes they're on your own behalf. Sometimes they're on other people's behalf. Um, the prophets later on criticized the offering of sacrifices because it was they, they considered a hollow gesture, that it's supposed to be an act of, of rep, almost of repentance. And if you don't follow up the sacrifice with a change in behavior, the sacrifices are meaningless. So the first break uh, with this way of life, this way of Jewing, was the destruction of the temple. When you the place where you were supposed to offer your sacrifices uh, is no longer accessible. What do you do? Um, it was also compounded by the fact that, it, that the, the Jewish people were taken away from their their their, whole, their homeland. So it was almost as if they were handed us they had a cell phone, reliable cell phone service, and suddenly, not only is the is the cell phone not working, even if you get it working, it there's no bars because you're exiled from your land. So they sort of had to suddenly, I guess, you know, assess: is this going to continue? Because at this point, it could have been game over, but they decided to remake Judaism by instituting what they called Mikdash Me'at, portable temples, mini temples, where they would gather, they would have sing songs, they would sing the songs that they used to sing in the temple, they would study Torah. They figured out a way to continue being Jewish without the traditional uh, markers of Judaism. Obviously, when they returned to the land of Israel and rebuilt the temple, these streams were functioning in parallel so, so uh you would have folks who would continue with the sing song and the gathering and, the, and what we would call a synagogue that would be studying of torah but they would also and do go and do sacrifices but the thing is that when the second temple was destroyed it was essentially we're done we're done with the sacrifices and the alternative path that was the remake became the norm And this, I guess you could say, launched us into what's called the biblical period. Um, and I put here a picture, sorry, rabbinic period. And I, I put here a picture of the shtetl in Poland, because when we think of rabbis and we think of like the rabbis running the show, we often think of, you know, that scene in Fiddler where all the people turn to the rabbi to ask the rabbi questions. But the reality is that, I mean, that was pretty much the way Jews continued to live well into the 19th and even the early 20th century in certain parts of Eastern Europe. Was it that different than how the Jews lived in Babylonia in the in the fifth century? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. And I'll, I'll explain why in a second. Um, in the earlier rabbinic period, which was centered around, as I said, Babylonia, um, at the time, they were really dealing, living in a world, a pagan world. Um, they had religious texts that were written anonymously namely the Babylonian Talmud. We, we know who appears in it, and we have a sense of a tradition of who edited it, but not in the, in the, we, we wouldn't say that Rav Ashi and Ravina are the authors of the Talmud. It becomes the guide to Jewish living, like the manual for how to live Jewishly. How to Jew, if you want to know, you crack open the Talmud and read it. As we move into the Middle Ages and we move to Europe, you have... Um, now, instead of being living in a pagan world, you're living in a Christian world. And you're living in the, in the, during under feudalism, where you live as a, as a community. We call, often call this corporate Judaism. 
where the Kihila Kedosha, the religious community, is, is the kind of functioning unit. Um, it's autonomous. It makes decisions for itself. It collects taxes. It provides services for people. Uh, it regulates the life of its members. This is where we start to sort of see the early kind of, you know, how shtetls were functioning. And then the last item or the last element of this period is the Beit Din, where the rabbinic court would make rulings and people would follow them. And if they didn't, they were kicked out. They were, they were put into harem. They were excommunicated. And that was a, a very powerful weapon to keep people in line. But then we have another rupture. This one, you could say, not wasn't self-inflicted, but it was more um, welcomed, I guess you could say. Uh, it was sort of in the spirit of the times. Modernity uh, pr proved a challenge for Jews on seven fronts. And Paul Mendes Flohr wrote the book on this. He cleverly called them the seven C's. And you're seeing them pop up on the screen in front of you. Um, the idea that you know, modernity challenged everything. It upended everything. How we know, how we understand the nature of, of being, how we understand uh, God and the universe and science, all these things came to the fore and challenged the traditional creed or belief that existed for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. Um, the Jewish law that used to run the autonomous community had to be now set aside for the more national laws that were coming in, into place. You know, Jews were now being legally integrated into their societies and they could not rely on Jewish law to make uh, the, the determinations for them. Also, um, the rabbis themselves uh, no longer held the kind of power that they used to hold. It was undermined. Torah used to be considered the, the, the fountain of truth, and now it can be found elsewhere, perhaps in science. The notion of a secular culture evolved that did not had nothing to do with religion, that you could be a citizen of a country as opposed to a subject of a king or part of a kihila also fundamentally attacked um, the Jewish way of looking at the world. So as Mendes Flor says, quote, to be traditional in the modern age is to be self-consciously so. It's almost like being aware suddenly that you're breathing oxygen, whereas for hundreds of years, you just sort of assumed that it was there. I think So for many Jews, this brought about a revolution, a remake completely. They remade the synagogue. They remade prayers. They remade themselves, the way they looked and the way they dressed and the way they lived. And for, at the same time, there were Jews who fundamentally rejected modernity and waged war against it and pushed it away as much as possible in their fashion, in their language, in their outlook, in where they lived, in the professions they pursued. Um, this group of rejectionists, as you could say, you know, they make up maybe a quarter of the population. It's a significant percentage, but it's not the majority by any means. And then the fifth break, I argued, was in 2007 eight. I argued was then, but in a sense, what I wrote then is equally correct now. So now I'm taking a page from Mendes Floor. I talked about the five Ds. Excuse me. The first being disaffiliation, that uh, Jewish people were. Uh, deconnecting or disconnecting from their synagogues. They were not, you know, synagogue memberships were decreasing and declining across the board. Uh, they were disaffiliating from, you know, the secular institutions, the communal institutions like APAC or the UJC or AJC. Um, they find them irrelevant in their lives, uh, in, even have negative associations with them. Um, and then there are all these attempts to sort of reaffiliate people through programs like Birthright, which is also finding limited success. Um, it's also manifest in what I've, I've heard referred to as Jew embarrassment, that uh, people feel uncomfortable and awkward in, in these kinds of settings. Um, you often hear people say, you know, I, I stay away from those places because um, that person, the person who's involved doesn't look like me, or I feel estranged from that person, or I feel incompetent and uncomfortable. I feel an outsider in those settings. Um, you know, I feel like I'm a tourist here. And so, there's an effort to say, you know, no, you're not a tourist. You're not a tourist. You're a, a traveler and, and you come here with a purpose and you come here to explore. But the thing is that to sort of beat that metaphor to death a little bit, and it probably deserves to be beaten to death. Um, travelers are not citizens and they don't vote and they don't pay taxes. They don't support 
the community. They don't have a say in how it's run. They're sort of there and then they leave. Uh, demographic delay, which is the second one, uh, talks about how people are waiting longer to get married and to have kids, which means that the numbers of Jews are not increasing uh, to replacement level. Um, the ramifications are that you know institutions that were designed for families will be less relevant for these folks if they're not with kids or with only one as opposed to two. Um, the third point is disaffection, where um, people just don't feel connected emotionally to the kind of narratives that used to unify the Jewish people. Dumbing down, um, I think it's pretty straightforward that there's sort of this acceptance. And again, it's not just amongst Jews, right? This is a, a larger cultural phenomenon that it's acceptable to dismiss expertise and that all opinions are equally valid. You know, just think of Facebook, right, as a, as a forum for, for public discourse, where basically, I, I, I don't know what to say about that beyond just Facebook. Um, but the last one is especially relevant now, that the pillars of our society, um, the federations, the foundations, the charitable organizations, the schools, the universities have all shut down. And the question is, will they reopen? So in coming weeks, what we're going to do, given all of this preamble, is look at what I think or what I'm hoping is next. And there's three phenomena that I want to explore in the, in the short term, and hopefully more will be added to this list. The first, um, and I guess if we can look into the Facebook chat to see if there's any questions. Um, about, I often hear people talk about, oh, you know, welcome to our virtual meeting, welcome to our virtual gathering, welcome to our virtual synagogue. And the thing is, um, I, there's nothing virtual about it. I mean, I'm here, you're here, we're real. Um, this technology we're using to mediate our communication doesn't make you any less of a person or me less of a person. This is a real gathering. Um, it may not be the kind of gathering that uh, was possible 50 years ago or 10 years ago, but it's still a real gathering. So this is still a real community. Um, depending on how old you are, uh, the distinction between IRL and online, you know, was probably very meaningful for you. And you sort of had a, a value judgment placed on face-to-face -face over online interaction. But the reality is like for my kids who are teenagers, they're aware that there's a difference between face-to-face -face and online. But I don't think they have the same kind of uh, privileging of the face-to-face -face over the online. And they may feel differently after this is over and, and, and the shelter-in-place order is, is revoked. But um, for right now, you know, they are communicating with their friends much in the same way they did before. You know, the ones that were distant and living in Israel, they would, you know, WhatsApp with them. And the ones that were living in the states or living in all around canada which is where we are uh, they would you know communicate via facetime and all kinds of other you know apps and things but the relationship continued to evolve and develop it didn't they didn't hit pause because they're not face to face so we can sort of consider um what the impact of that reality is going to be going forward the other uh thing i want to talk about specifically next week as we roll into pesach is the second phenomenon, which I said, well, which I call welcome to the 21st century. This is referring to those folks who sort of took up arms against modernity and rejected it in all of its forms and waged, a, and in some cases, a rear guard action against the, uh, the penetration of modernity into Jewish life. And I want to have a look next week at how these sectors of our community who reject the present and all of its technologies are slowly entering the 21st century uh, because ironically, of this app platform right now because of Zoom and what the whole Zoom discussion has wrought in the Haredi world. And in coming meetups, uh, we'll look at other norms and trends that are emerging as we continue to physically distance, and we can consider what we want um, in terms of what from the status quo ante we'd like to see brought into the present and in the future, and things we'd like to sort of put aside you know, in our remake, because we're going to have to do a remake after this is over, what are we going to keep and what are we going to remake and make new? So 
I want to see if I can, uh, I'm going to stop the screen share. That's what I'm going to do. And uh, see if I can pull up the, the chat. I don't know if I'll be able to do that. I didn't practice that. But either way, um, I will be back here next week at an earlier time because at this time I believe uh, all of us will be at our various seders um, and enjoying that experience, that brand new experience. And hopefully uh, we will uh, have more to talk about at this time, not at this time next week, at the, next week at some time earlier in the day. And, and in future sessions, we will explore more together. So thank you, everybody. Uh, and be well and wash hands. Don't touch your face. <laughs>